All right, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. On behalf of the American Enterprise Institute and the Seaboy and Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State, it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning for a look ahead to the coming year in uh, regulatory litigation in the Supreme Court and the lower courts. My name's Adam White. I'm a uh, resident scholar at AEI, and I direct the Gray Center. Uh, so I can actually welcome you on behalf of both groups. Uh, I, now, I have to admit, at this time of year, when various groups host Supreme Court previews, administrative law is not always the most glamorous stuff that you think of about what's happening in the coming year. In fact, as we were getting ready for this morning's event, I thought back to a, a, a talk that Justice Scalia gave uh, many years ago. Scalia, not just the namesake of the Scalia Law School, but also a former AEI fellow. Uh, he introduced a talk by saying, administrative law is not for sissies, so you should lean back, clutch the side of your chairs, and steal yourselves for a pretty dull lecture. <laughs> I hope this will turn out better than that. Uh, but actually, in recent years, we've seen a number of important administrative law cases come through the Supreme Court uh, and come up through the lower courts. And so we thought, at the beginning of the year, it's important to focus on that part of the Supreme Court's docket and the lower courts, especially at a time when there's so much debate over the nature of modern administration and the rules that govern agencies. Just last year, the court wrapped up its work with three significant cases I'm sure you've heard of. Kaiser versus Wilkie on the deference that courts give to agency interpretations of regulations. Gundy versus United States on the breadth of powers that Congress delegates to agencies. And Department of Commerce versus New York on the standards that courts apply in scrutinizing an agency's justification for its policies and actions. In that case, the Department of Commerce's uh, addition of the citizenship question to the census. Now, for today's discussion, we couldn't think, we couldn't find uh, four better panelists to weigh in on very a various aspects of the court's work. I'll introduce them in the order they're going to speak. We're going to start with Chris Walker. He is a professor of law at the Ohio State University's Moritz College of Law, where he's written and co-written some of the leading studies on judicial deference to agencies and the agency's approach to writing regulations and legislation. Next, we'll hear from Ellen Gilmer. She just became a senior legal reporter at Bloomberg Environment. She previously was a legal editor and reporter for E&E &E News. She mentioned beforehand she's actually on her vacation between the two, her two jobs. This is how she spends her vacations, giving talks on regulatory litigation. Third, a man who no, needs no introduction at AEI, Peter Wallison. He's a senior fellow and the, and the Arthur Burns Fellow in Financial Policy Studies. He's the author of several books, including most recently and most relevantly, Judicial Fortitude, The Last Chance to Reign in the Administrative State. And our fourth guest is Amit Narang. He's a, reg a regulatory policy ad advocate for public citizen and an expert on issues related to the federal regulatory process. He previously served as articles editor for the Administrative Law Review, a leading journal on regulatory law and policy. So Chris, why don't you begin? bit and talk a little bit about the three cases Adam just mentioned briefly not to recap last term but I think all three cases are going to be ones that are going to affect the lower courts in the coming years in really dramatic ways and I'm not going to spend too much time on Gundy versus United States the non-delegation case because my understanding is Peter's going to dive into a little bit more uh, about some of the litigations going on right now on non-delegation but this is a really important case uh, so I wanted to kind of mention the non-delegation doctrine is the idea that under Article I of the Constitution, it says all legislative powers granted herein uh, are given to uh, Congress, right? Uh, and the Supreme Court in the 1930s said that means that Congress can't delegate legislative power uh, to other branches of government or to anyone else. Uh, it's a doctrine that has only been successful twice, both in the 1930s and since has kind of remained dormant. Uh, there haven't been successful challenges to statutes based on non-delegation grounds. And a lot of folks thought that last term might be the year that we have the first one in a while because it dealt with the criminal statute with sex offender registration. Um, the court ultimately up upheld the delegation in that case, but I think what's noteworthy is the required fifth vote there was Justice Alito, in which he said, I'm willing to reconsider this. Uh, add that to the, uh, to the dissenters uh, and to Judge Justice Kavanaugh, who didn't participate. Uh, and you have this open invitation now uh, for regulated entities and other parties to start bringing these challenges under non-delegation doctrine. And you have at least four votes on the record wanting to reinvigorate the doctrine to start narrowing delegations that Congress gives to agencies uh, 
And my guess is Justice Kavanaugh is probably right on board with that too. So we're going to have a lot of litigation in the coming years on non-delegation. In Kaiser v. Wilkie, this was a, a straight up, the question presented was straight up whether to get rid of our deference, which is the deference agencies get to their own regulatory interpretations. Um, again, a lot of us thought if the court grants a case with only one question, whether to get rid of something, they probably are going to get rid of it, right? I mean, at least that was my kind of intuition going in. Um, the court ultimately said they were keeping it. Justice Kagan, in, a, in a, just a really trenchant opinion, uh, says we're keeping it. Then she goes on to explain why what used to be one step is now five steps. So before, the court just had to ask, is the regulation, uh, is the agency interpretation plainly inconsistent with the regulation? Now you have to jump through five different hoops for the agency to prevail. Importantly, they added on the two Chevron steps, and Justice Kagan said, and we mean these steps, so all of the narrowing, the statute has to be ambiguous, and the agency's interpretation has to be reasonable. But they also added on some other stuff that I think is interesting. The agency's interpretation has to be authoritative, for instance, uh, which is uh, something I don't even know what that means. Uh, like, and I don't think Justice Kagan did either. She kind of left it open. And we're going to have a lot of litigation on whether an agency's interpretation is authoritative. In other words, if the agency just posts something on their website and says, this is what we think the regulation means, probably not authoritative. If they send a dear colleague letter to university, probably not authoritative. And so we have those kind of questions. The last two are whether the agency is ex exercising expertise. That's another realm where we're going to see a lot of litigation going forward. Uh, you already saw that in the Chevron deference context, and I think you'll see that in our. And the last is one we already actually had, which is unfair surprise. You can't do a regulatory interpretation that would create unfair surprise. The census case, I just want to flag real briefly one point. Ultimately, Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the court, uh, sent the census question back to the secretary for reconsideration, and we know that the secretary ultimately decided not to do anything with that. But in doing so, he blessed, uh, he tried not to, but he did bless a new idea that it's going to be a little bit easier to challenge the motives that agencies have. In other words, and this is not a new play. Anyone that's challenged a regulatory, whether you know on, on the left or the right, will say that the agency had bad motives. Uh, and I think that opinion, usually in the past, that's not relevant. You just look at the administrative record, and it's up, down, vote. I think if you read Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, you do open this door now for us to really say, let's peel that back. Let's, do some, let's look at the emails. Let's look at the internal information. He tried to close the door. He tried to say this was unusual, but I think you'll have that going forward. I want to just briefly mention two cases of the court this term that deal with administrative law. The first uh, is uh, DACA. Is, uh, the deferred action is back at the Supreme Court uh, in the immigration context. Now, you may remember originally during the Obama administration, uh, the Obama administration issued two executive actions, in, you know, one, in, one in one year and uh, one two years later. The first dealt with children uh, of U.S. citizens that are not U.S. citizens, and they were able to apply for a certain type of deferred action. It didn't create new rights or, 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 or obligations, but it allowed those individuals to kind of operate in the United States, be able to get work, be able to go to school, um, uh, and avoid being removed from the United States for two years. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, President Obama came forward and said, all right, I want to be a little bit more aggressive. We're going to make it even more expansive for those children. They can now have three years, and they don't have to have been here as long. And, but we're also going to add parents uh, of U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents to this program. And you might remember some of the states started litigation down in Texas and said this is unlawful. It, one, they didn't follow the right procedures, and two, it's not allowed under the Immigration and Nationality Act. The Fifth Circuit ultimately agreed that it was unlawful. It went up to the Supreme Court, uh, and the Justice Scalia passed away after the case had been granted, and the court was deadlocked 4-4. So the Fifth Circuit's decision invalidating DAPA, the parent one that was broader, the later one, uh, was, was affirmed, right? Um, when the Trump administration took over, the state of Texas set up, we also now want to attack DACA, the first one that deals with children, and that's this litigation. Uh, in response to that, the Trump administration said, we're not, um, we aren't going to enforce this. We're withdrawing this, 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 this executive action. We're not going to uh, continue DACA beyond those who currently have that deferred action status. And a number of, of you know, individuals and groups sued, including universities, to block that. Uh, in the Ninth Circuit, uh, you had nationwide injunctions at the district court level. Uh, you had some litigation throughout the country. Um, and ultimately, the Supreme Court decided to take the case. Uh, 
uh, based on that district court litigation. Now, what's interesting about this is under the Administrative Procedure Act, you generally can't review agency uh, actions that are, are, are given to agency discretion. It's not reviewable. So the first response the Trump administration has is, this was completely discretionary. President Obama said it was completely discretionary. It is completely discretionary. It's not reviewable. The problem was originally the Secretary of Homeland Security said the reason we're withdrawing this is because it's not lawful. And so the litigants, and I think rightly the courts, also said, well, if you're saying you don't have any discretion, we should be able to review that, right? Um, what's interesting, though, is in the interim, and I'll end here. I'm not going to get to the risk corridor case because we can talk about that later. But well, in the interim, a district court in D.C. asked for supplemental briefing on the secretary's position, like, tell us a little bit more of why you're doing this. Uh, and she came forward and gave additional reasons that are more policy-centered reasons. I'm worried about litigation risk. We want to send a message to the border about uh, how we're going to enforce immigration. She gave a normal reasons that would normally survive arbitrary and capricious review. So my guess is ultimately the court, uh, there'll be at least five votes to, to say that it's either unreviewable or that it's lawful under the Ministry Procedure Act. There's a fun risk corridor case, the Affordable Care Act, but maybe we'll get to that in the Q&A. Maybe it's not fun. Ellen's like, it's not fun. No, it is, it is fun. It's $10 billion, $12 billion fun. I meant to mention when I introduced Chris uh, that one of the best resources on tracking day-to-day -day developments in administrative law uh, from a scholarly perspective is the Yale Journal on Regulations blog, which Chris really helped to sort of co-found or re-found, and he's one of the regular contributors. So keep an eye on it. Ellen? It, that blog is also helpful for journalists, at least if they're wonky journalists like I am. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as Adam said, I uh, am starting at Bloomberg Environment on Monday. I previously worked for E&E News covering environmental law. Uh, so I'm going to focus on a few cases that I think should be on everyone's radar uh, coming up. Uh, you know, a lot of people say all, almost all environmental law is actually administrative law, which is generally the case. It's all this regulatory wrangling. Um, the Supreme Court is throwing me off this year because the two environmental cases, big ones that they have on the docket, are really not administrative cases. Um, there's Clean Water Act case, there's Superfund case, so I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about what's happening in the lower courts um, in the environmental arena that uh, is important for people who care about regulations. Um, so there are three big, uh, I mean, there are, there are a million different uh, regulatory reform pushes happening right now. There are three environmental ones that I'm going to focus on. The first is the affordable clean energy rule. Um, so this is the Trump administration's replacement for the clean power plan, which was the Obama administration's sort of signature marquee effort to address climate change by cutting emissions from the power sector. The Trump administration, the rule never took effect, the Supreme Court stated. it. The Trump administration came in and decided uh, to take a second look at that regulation and see whether it was appropriate. Uh, they came back just this summer, finally finalized uh, the Affordable Clean Energy Rule, which uh, is a dramatically scaled back version of the Obama plan. It just aims to cut emissions from individual power plants. Uh, it's considered uh, a, you know, a lot easier for the regulated community. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, it's already facing a lot of litigation. The Clean Power Plan case, if you're familiar with it, was just one of the biggest cases um, at the DC Circuit, that uh, certainly the biggest one I've ever covered. It was almost eight hours of oral arguments. It was insane. Um, the Affordable Clean Energy Rule litigation is shaping up to be quite big too, probably not quite as big. Um, but it's a big case. It's important to watch. You have public health groups, environmental groups, primarily blue states, some utilities that are challenging the rule. You have uh, a lot of other states, uh, energy companies, uh, conservative groups, other people who are defending the current rule. Um, and it's, it, the litigation has just started in the DC circuit. Uh, you have a variety of claims. Some are Clean Air Act based. Some uh, are just pure administrative law issues. So you have litigants who are challenging uh, the Trump administration's rewrite as essentially sloppy, uh, ignoring certain data. Uh, the Obama administration spent years and years and years and years building this record. And the Trump administration had a, very, a lot shorter amount of time to, to do what it wanted to do on this, to, to really uh, scale down the rule. So, uh, so you have challenges on that. Um, you have challenges on cost benefit, you know, allegations that the cost benefit analysis uh, is improper, that the calculations are misleading, uh, and all of this is going to 
be up in the DC circuit uh, probably as soon as this fall, maybe next year, depending on how quickly they move the case. The litigation has, has really just begun. Um, and it's gonna affect future administrations, it could affect future administrations' ability to regulate greenhouse gas emissions um, from the power sector or using the Clean Air Act. Um, so it's an important case to watch. It's also one that uh, is likely gonna grab the Supreme Court's attention um, either way it turns out. Uh, so that's sort of a, a preview for a future term or a shadow docket or something. Uh, the second uh, regulatory reform uh, issue I wanna talk about is the clean cars rule. Again, this is uh, an Obama era, Obama era standards for fuel economy and greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles. The Trump administration last year decided it was gonna reopen these standards, take a second look at them, decide whether they were appropriate. That action in itself, just the decision to reopen the standards, has triggered litigation. The DC Circuit heard oral arguments last week. Uh, the challenges, again, are focused on a lot of technical issues. The allegations are that the Trump administration didn't adequately justify its decision to uh, reopen these standards. It didn't follow uh, its own procedures, EPA's own procedures for reopening it in DOT. Um, and so we'll see how that case turns out, but it's all really a preview for the bigger case, which is when the Trump administration actually finalizes new standards, new car standards, uh, that's gonna be the, the big litigation, especially because in conjunction with that, uh, the Trump administration may revoke a waiver that California has that allows California to set its own standards and lets other states follow California. That's gonna be a huge um, legal battle, uh, potentially bigger than the affordable clean energy um, fight. And it's gonna be a variety of you know, federalism issues, Clean Air Act issues, but also big administrative law issues like we talked about before. Um, there are a lot of technical concerns that uh, cr critics of the Trump administration's approach have raised about uh, the draft um, rollback of the standards. Um, these are very technical dealing with, you know, how cheap is a car? How does that affect how much people drive? How does that affect safety of roads, et cetera? Um, and then the last one that I'll touch on, if I have enough time. Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, is Endangered Species Act regulations. This was a big fish that, uh, that the Trump administration wanted to take care of, uh, wanted to get. Uh, this is, depending on whom you ask, uh, an effort to modernize or gut the Endangered Species Act implementation. Um, there are a, a lot of various technical provisions of the regulatory update. Uh, a couple of the biggest ones are, if it's a threatened species, it doesn't automatically get the same protections as an endangered species. Uh, there are some new constraints for how the government protects critical habitat for species. So there's a big battle that's just started on that again states, environmental groups, uh, they're challenging really classic administrative law argument, they're making really classic administrative law arguments uh, that the final rule is not a logical outgrowth of the draft rule, the public wasn't properly involved in the, in the rulemaking process, the analysis is poor, they didn't go through NEPA, et cetera. So all those kind of standard arguments, um, and we'll see how that all plays out in court. The Trump administration says these challengers don't have standing uh, that it's, it's not, um, excuse me, that, uh, 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 that, the, that they don't have standing, that um, it's not fully briefed yet. Um, none of these cases are fully briefed yet, so uh, it's a little too soon to say whether we're gonna be breaking any new ground in like administrative law, and honestly, I think probably not. It's not gonna be some groundbreaking new doctrine um, or new doctrinal changes that we're dealing with, but it's gonna be really important um, decisions that courts are making on what kind of deregulatory actions will stick and whatever the outcomes are in these various cases will affect certainly you know all future litigation on, on regulations it's uh, it's going to set some new precedent um, binding or, or at least persuasive in terms of just how far can an administration go um, to change regulations what level of explanation is appropriate, um, how much deference do they get in that area. Um, so it's something to watch because it's gonna affect deregulatory litigation for years to come. Great. Thanks, Ellen. Ellen, the cases you went through, if I heard correctly, all of them are all at a pretty preliminary stage, right? They just Very. wrapped up in the agency, which means at most maybe the, the DC Circuit or other courts will, will decide these issues maybe the spring 
which means a cert stage, Supreme Court stage, really wouldn't be reached until right around the fall, right? right? Pushing up against the election, meaning if there's a change in administrations, these things might not be seen all the way through to the Supreme Court, not that the court takes many of these cases. That's but, right, But yeah. it will run up into that sort of possibility of, of a change of administrations. Yeah, it, it's gonna get really complicated. It could get really complicated. Uh, the Trump administration, especially on the affordable clean energy rule, they're pushing to, to move that litigation as quickly as possible because they wanna be um, certain that they're gonna be in place to defend the regulation before the Supreme Court if and when it gets to that point. Great. Thanks. Now, Peter, you've been a leading voice on the non-delegation issue uh, throughout the Gunny litigation. I know you've had your eye on another case coming up in the lower courts. Uh, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I would. <clears throat> Actually, Gundy was a little disappointing. Yeah. Um, turned out that uh, Kavanaugh had not taken his oath of office in time to hear the Gundy case, so there was not going to be, if there would have been, uh, five votes um, to take this on as a non-delegation case. But there is another one coming along, and I thought I would talk about that in some detail. Um, this, is a, this is now in the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which hears appeals from the International Trade Court. The name of the case is the American Institute for International Steel versus the United States, and was brought by an organization of steel companies in, in 2018 to contest the president's tariffs on steel. Their claim is that the law under which the president acted confers so much unrestricted and discretionary authority on the president that it, it is, in fact, an unconstitutional delegation of legislative authority. That is the only claim that is being made in this case. It's a purely non-delegation claim. In the past, this has not been a winning formula, uh, but given the new composition of the court, now Kavanaugh is in place and ready to hear a case if this one gets to the Supreme Court, um, the, the, the change in the composition of the court could uh, make this a very significant case. Um, if so, as I outline in my book, which is called Judicial Fortitude, it will over time significantly reduce the power of the agencies of the administrative state. The Constitution, as you know, creates a separation of powers. Congress is vested with all power to make the laws. The president and the executive <coughs> branch have all the authority to enforce the laws, but only that authority, and the judiciary is authorized to interpret the laws. Under this tripartite structure, Congress is not permitted uh, to give, and the usual term is delegate, any of its powers to the president. Uh, Chris just talked about this. Uh, or to the agencies of the executive branch. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says that Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. So where did the president get the authority to impose tariffs on steel? Of course, Congress can enact a law that authorizes the president to carry out, force any tariffs that have been authorized by Congress. And in Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, Congress did, in fact, authorize the president to impose tariffs on otherwise or otherwise restrict the importation of any article that, in the president's view, threatens to impair national security. The key point from the perspective of the plaintiffs is that there are no restrictions on this power. The president can choose any article of commerce and impose a tariff on or any other kind of restriction that limits its importation into the United States. The only question is whether he has determined that this is necessary for national security. The plaintiff steel companies here are arguing that by giving the president the unrestricted power to impose tariffs of any size on any article of commerce, com Congress has in effect delegated to the president all of Congress's power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. If so, that would be a violation of the Constitution's separation of powers. Now, this isn't a minor issue, and I guess everyone up here knows this. Uh, the framers of the Constitution deliberately separated the power to make laws from the power to enforce the laws. They believe that when the same person or group has both the power to make a law and to enforce a law, tyranny will result. In addition, in a democracy, the major decisions for society have to be made by a representative body like Congress and not by an administrative agency that is unelected. The separation of powers, in other words, 
is arguably the central element of the Constitution and a vital protection of the liberties of the American people. Still, the Supreme Court has not, since 1935, held that Congress has unconstitutionally delegated legislative authority to the president or the executive branch. And the two cases that year were the only time Congress has ever done that. The key question in the delegation of legislative authority is whether Congress has placed any restriction on the use of the power it has delegated. For almost 100 years, in the few cases where a delegation of a legislative authority has been challenged, the Supreme Court has held that if Congress includes an intelligible principle in its legislation, that will be sufficient to overcome a claim that Congress has delegated legislative authority. The idea, apparently, is that an intelligible principle would be a sufficient limitation on the discretion the president or any agency uh, might have to avoid a finding of unconstitutional delegation. This is where the argument in this Steele case will be joined. Is the statute's requirement that the president consider national security in making his decision an intelligible principle, or is it not? On its face, allowing the president to do anything he wants for national security purposes does not seem to be a restriction or limitation of any kind, and thus not an intelligible principle. The plaintiff lost at the International Trade Court, and they expect to lose also, according to their counsel, um, before the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. This is because in a 1976 case, Federal Energy Administration versus Algonquin, I'll call it the Algonquin case, the Supreme Court said this, Section 232, and this is the one we're talking about, the section of that uh, 1962 act, does not constitute an improper delegation of power since it establishes clear preconditions to presidential action, including a finding by the Secretary of the Treasury that the article is being imported in such quantities or under such circumstances as to threaten or impair the national security. Tough language to deal with if you're uh, contesting that before the Supreme Court. No lower court is likely to contradict the Supreme Court's broad language in construing 232. So what are the prospects for the plaintiff in this case? If the Supreme Court agrees to take the case, that will be a major event in constitutional and administrative law. It will mean that at least four justices are willing to reconsider whether Algonquin was, was properly decided, and also it will mean that Section 232 could be deemed an unconstitutional delegation of legislative authority with one more <coughs> justice on the case. Even more important, it will mean that at least four justices, for the first time since 1935, are willing to consider bringing back to life what is called the non-delegation doctrine. That is the idea that the courts have the authority and the obligation to decide an appropriate case whether Congress has delegated legislative authority to the executive branch. In my view, with the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh last year, there are now five justices Roberts, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and G Kavanaugh, who might be willing to restrict broadly stated delegations of authority to the president or the executive branch. If the Supreme Court does restore the non-delegation doctrine, it would go a long way toward controlling the growth of the administrative state, and this is actually what my book is about. In that book, I argue that the administrative state has become so powerful because since the New Deal, Congress has been willing to, to adopt legislation that gives broad new authorities, like Section 232, to federal administrative agencies. By doing this, Congress can avoid the difficult decisions and the accountability to voters involved in enacting controversial laws. Members of Congress often tell their constituents that they have enacted legislation that addresses important national problems. While in effect, they have only given unelected officials the power to make the most difficult and controversial decisions. The Clean Water Act is really a good example of that. The decisions that, that in a democracy should be made only by a representative body, like a Congress, 
are made in effect by these administrative agencies. If the courts begin to judge whether Congress has delegated excessive legislative authority to the executive branch, it will force Congress to make many of the decisions that it now routinely passes along to administrative agencies. It may well be, of course, that the Supreme Court will not agree to take up this steel industries case. But if it does, the court's decision would have momentous consequences, I think, for the administrative state. Thanks, Peter. Um, it's an interesting case in many ways. There's also sort of an irony to it, right? That the original, the very first Supreme Court non-delegation case by Justice, Chief Justice Marshall around 1820 was in a sense a, a national security tariffs case, right? It was the, the tariffs against England and France uh, in, I guess, in, in, in the context of the war of that time. Much uh, of the non-delegation litigation has involved tariff cases yeah. where the president has seemed to be taking a lot of the power that Congress was given in the yeah, it's interesting that it all kind of comes full circle now. Um, well, thank you. Amit? Okay, great. Thanks, Adam. Um, thanks to the fellow, uh, fellow panelists. Thanks for including me. Of course. Um, very timely topic, obviously. Um, okay, so I'm going to add a little different uh, flavor to this panel in the sense that I'm going to be talking about um, a case that the Supreme Court might or might not hear. Um, so the cert petition I'm talking about uh, is called Guedes, uh I think I'm pronouncing that right, Guedes uh, versus ATF. Um, actually, it was just filed um, right before Labor Day. And uh, I find this uh, cert petition to be very intriguing uh, for a number of different reasons. First, uh, it involves a challenge to uh, the uh, Trump administration's um, ban on uh, bump stock devices. If you're familiar with uh, those, uh, they you know, became very controversial uh, after the Las Vegas uh, uh, massacre in 2017, where the uh, shooter had uh, used a, a, this bump uh, stock device. I'm not a, a gun expert here, so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, used a, a bump stock device to, confer, to co uh, convert a semi-automatic uh, semi weapon to a fully automatic one and then was able to uh, shoot more rounds because of that. Um, the Trump administration uh, uh, in, I believe, December of 2018 finalized uh, a ban uh, under their authority under the National Firearms Act uh, uh, on these bump stock devices. And, you know, this is uh, one of the few, maybe only, uh, real gun control measure that the Trump administration has, has taken. Uh, so it would be um, interesting, uh, to say the least, to see uh, the Supreme Court overturn that. Um, the, uh, there are a couple of oddities in the case that I'm, I want to go to uh, uh, talk about in a minute um, that also make it intriguing. But, of course, most important, I think that this case uh, potentially presents um, the best opportunity for uh, a facial direct challenge to, to Chevron, or at least limiting the scope of uh, Chevron. Uh, in this term, um, you know, uh, Professor Walker talked about um, Kaiser. I think uh, most were surprised to see that outcome. I certainly was surprised uh, to see uh, our difference uh, live another day. Um, and uh, so I think you know, the, uh, the talk has been, hey, what, what is the, the next opportunity for uh, the court, uh, obviously, uh, growing increasingly conservative, and, and, and generally speaking, I think, uh, you know, uh, skepticism uh, of and, and uh, potentially even outright opposition to Chevron deference is becoming a litmus test for uh, conservative uh, 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 justice nominees uh, and, and judicial nominees. Um, what is the next case uh, that the uh, court would hear? Uh, to go after uh, Chevron, um, I think a lot of um, a lot has been made about uh, the very uh, uh, terse uh, language from uh, Justice Roberts in our distinguishing sh uh, Chevron from our. I'm not exactly sure what to read into that, to be quite honest. But a lot of folks have been more than willing to read quite a bit into it. Um, so, uh, if the uh, let me get to uh, uh, prospects of. Um, um, uh, the petition being taken up in, uh, near the end of my remarks. Uh, so I'll go through the, the history here a little bit. Um, it, uh, the, it was challenged, obviously, in district court. Um, the, uh, it was a, a motion for a preliminary injunction. So the stay was denied by the district court, uh, appealed to the D.C. Circuit. Um, that also uh, was denied. Uh, and then um, and, and the D.C. Circuit denied it all because of uh, uh, lack of merit, so I'll go into that in a little bit. And then uh, the stay was um, denied by the Supreme Court. It was appealed to the Supreme Court and denied, although uh, Justices Gorsuch and Thomas voted to, to hear the, the, uh, the, the request for the stay. So, um, the, I think what makes the case so interesting is that essentially it, in, 
uh, evolves involves a challenge to um, the uh, uh, a challenge to the um, uh, accordance of Chevron deference by the D.C. Circuit uh, to uh, the um, ATF and their interpretation of uh, the term machine gun uh, in the National Firearms Act, where the D.C. Circuit granted deference to uh, you know the ATF that had invoked Chevron in claiming that bump stock devices are machine gun uh, fall within the term machine gun for purposes of uh, prohibiting them under the National uh, Firearms Act. Um, you know, what uh, uh, was uh, particularly interesting is the, the claim was that, um, in fact, uh, the court, the D.C. Circuit, should have uh, applied a different uh, canon of interpretation uh, specific to criminal law. Uh, that canon is known as the rule of lenity. Uh, instead of applying Chevron deference, um, to uh, 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 essentially the, uh, their judgment of the case. Um, one of the odd quirks of this case, I'm not sure exactly uh, how this happened, but um, the agency itself did uh, claim uh, Chevron deference, or invoke Chevron deference, I should say, by claiming that the uh, term machine gun is ambiguous, okay? Um, but DOJ uh, took the exact opposite posture, saying that actually, we're not seeking Chevron deference. We don't uh, believe that the term is ambiguous. We think that the plain reading of the term machine gun enc encompasses bump stock devices. You know, I'm not sure what happened there. I don't see that that often, although maybe the federal, fellow panelists can uh, give me some examples. Um, it, it resulted in a, in a separate issue that the DC Circuit had to deal with, uh, which relates to waiving Chevron deference, uh, where the DC Circuit, the, the challengers were claiming that Chevron deference had been waived uh, uh, due to the DOJ's posture. And uh, the court said, we're not going to grant uh, the waiver of Chevron deference. You know, this is a, a canon of interpretation. Um, and uh, also, if we, if, if we start allowing uh, the waiver of Chevron deference, we uh, allow agencies and potentially, uh, you know, administrations to do all kinds of funny things, like claim one thing is a notice and comment rulemaking, and, and, and then the next administration claims maybe it's an interpretive rule without the force and effect of law. Um, so now on the uh, Chevron versus rule of lenity case, um, essentially the DC Circuit uh, said that Supreme Court precedent uh, indicates that uh, Chevron should take precedence with respect to the rule of lenity. Essentially, Chevron's interpretive canon, the rule of lenity is a substantive uh, canon of interpretation. Um, and in any case, uh, when it comes to uh, 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 statutory ambiguity that involves um, both civil and criminal penalties. This is the, the uh, unique, interesting part of the, the case. When we're talking about um, statutes that involve both civil and criminal penalties, and of course we have many of those uh, across the government, right, um, that uh, Chevron takes precedent over the rule of lenity. If it was a statute, essentially, that was just a criminal statute, uh, Supreme Court precedent is fairly clear in indicating that the rule of lenity takes precedence. Chevron really doesn't have any role. There is no delegation um, uh, with respect to uh, um, uh, criminal laws in the same way uh, that you get a, a, a delegation with respect to civil you know, laws that uh, contain both criminal and uh, civil penalties. But uh, you know, what's, I think what's also interesting here is that the full sum of Supreme Court precedent on this particular issue Chevron versus rule of lenity with respect to statutes that have both criminal and civil penalties is contained in a footnote uh, in a 1995 case named Babbitt, footnote 18, <laughs> if you want to look it up. Um, and that has uh, essentially been uh, the full sum of uh, the Supreme Court speaking to this issue and has been considered to be controlling precedent. So, um, you know, the challengers here are claiming that uh, the Supreme Court really hasn't spoken to it. And also, Judge Henderson uh, on the D.C. Circuit, who dissented, said, I don't, I don't believe that a footnote in the Supreme Court cases uh, amounts to controlling precedent in this issue. It raises the issue uh, and raises the prospect of pushing the Supreme Court to actually speak to this issue, the conflict between Chevron and the rule of lenity, in uh, these uh, dual use statutes or dual statutes. Um, so now prospects for hearing it. I don't think it's very likely that the Supreme Court is gonna take this case up. Um, uh, you know, a, a little bit reading into the, the stay denial, but um, if the Supreme Court uh, 
I, I say that because I'm not sure that uh, this is quite the, the vehicle that the court would be looking for uh, with respect to addressing Chevron. Um, you know, if the court does take the case, I think that would be uh, quite uh, uh, an important um, signal, quite a, uh, an interesting development because I, I do think the prognostication immediately will be, okay, well, now the court is asserting that it's trying to go after Chevron again, and uh, potentially they're, they're trying to find a, a beachhead, you know, in the case of uh, uh, the criminal law um, and Chevron deference uh, in, in the context of criminal laws to try to attack Chevron and then uh, limit the scope of, of uh, Chevron. Um, I, I definitely see exactly that uh, framing coming um, if the court... Uh, takes up the case. Um, at the same time, you know, I think there's another way of uh, reading it, which is uh, this case for me uh, points out another one of the interesting, uh, often overlooked applications of uh, Chevron deference here in these criminal civil uh, uh, statutes. Um, and Professor Walker has done such amazing work uh, talking about uh, the kind of disruptive practical impact we would have in overturning Chevron, especially when it comes to the, the reliance the, uh, that uh, lower courts have on, on Chevron, especially district courts. Um, Professor Walker's empirical work on that is um, uh, really illuminating. Um, and so I think this is another uh, feature of that. Uh, we have so many of these statutes that uh, potentially we, we would get into a situation if uh, the court took up the case uh, and backed the challengers, uh, we would get into a situation where uh, agencies you know, are going to be uh, limited in their ability to uh, interpret statutory ambiguity in the context of statutes that, that include both criminal and civil penalties. You know, on the Chevron issue, sometimes it's hard to really show the Supreme Court that Chevron really made a difference in a given case, right? Would it come out of differently without Chevron deference? This, the rule of lenity in the criminal context is an area that becomes very clear, right? In the way, rule of lenity is, is a rule of deference to the criminal defendant. Right. The other area where this comes up, came up recently, was in the veterans law context, where there's a canon of construction in favor of a veteran who's appealing for benefits. Now, there was a big case also, I guess, in the federal circuit. It was called Procopio, uh, James Ridgway, a veterans law expert. Is that case still pending in the federal circuit? Or? No, that no. case was uh, decided. Um, there's at least one other uh, Chevron-related cert petition pending right now. Called it's a case called Valent, which I think is the Social Security Administration. Um, just one other case to put on the table. Uh, there's a cert petition in a case called Seal of Law versus Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This is the the latest of the constitutional challenges to the structure of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, I won't I won't delve into it too far. It's just an argument that an agency with this kind of, of um, of independence from the president must be structured as a multi-member commission, not as a, a single-headed agency. Uh, that case was interesting. There was an earlier case, which many years ago I was involved in a precursor to it, a uh, challenge to the CFPB. And in that one, the Justice Department actually, the Trump Justice Department actually conceded the merits of the case, said, yeah, there's a constitutional problem with the structure of the CFPB, but this particular litigation isn't the right vehicle. Uh, the Justice Department has asked for two extensions on its reply to the cert petition. I think their, their response is now due maybe September 28th. So it'll be interesting to see what the Justice Department does uh, in that case. Chris, you mentioned the ACA risk corridors case. We have a couple of minutes. Do you want to just explain real briefly what that case is about and where it stands? Yeah, so this is another, the Affordable Care Act is back at the Supreme Court uh, this term. Uh, it's not a, a, the big case, but I think it's actually really fascinating. Uh, part of the Affordable Care Act was a risk corridors program where insurance companies could agree to participate, and it's kind of a, it's a risk-sharing agreement where the government, at least that's the way I'll frame it, maybe others will disagree, including uh, the insurance companies that are challenging the, the lower course decision. But the idea is that if you enter into it and you have a better year than, you, than was expected, you've got to give money to the risk corridor fund. And if you have a worse year than you were expected, you get to pull money from the risk corridor fund. I think maybe originally the, the framers of the Affordable Care Act were... Uh, thinking that this would be kind of a zero-sum, you know, in-out thing. As, as we know, the Affordable Care Act didn't quite get implemented the way we m most were hoping there would actually be you know, a success on this front. Uh, and the first, in, in 2014, 
$362 million came into the fund, and $2.87 billion needed to come out of the fund, right? Um, over the next three years, that deficit ended up being $12 billion. Um, so some members of Congress are like, what do we do about this? We, this is not what we think, or at least these members of Congress don't, didn't think that this should be how this works, where the government's just paying the difference. Uh, it really should just be you know, an offset from what, what other companies are making. And so they asked the GAO, well, how, how, do, how is this funded? And the GAO said, well, it's two ways. One, it's funded by the ex express appropriation f for this risk sharing. You know, you could stop those user fees and that would you know, stop the program. It's also funded out of the general uh, funding uh, for CMS. Uh, and so what did Congress do in the next appropriation bill? They said, we're going to continue to fund the, user, the, uh, the risk quarter offsetting. So if there's any money left, you can share it. Um, we're going to continue to fund the general fund, but they added a substantive rider, but not for risk corridors. In other words, you're not getting money for this. Now the insurance companies obviously got very mad. The language of the authorizing statute, the Affordable Care Act, doesn't provide any discretion. Uh, and so they say, once Congress authorizes this program and we invested and relied on it, you've got to pay us, right? Uh, it went before the Federal Circuit, and the Federal Circuit said, it's clear enough to us that Congress meant to disappropriate the general fund. So the only money you have available, you're gonna get you know, pennies on the dollar based on what comes in. Uh, it, the Supreme Court took the case, which is interesting, right? Um, usually the Supreme Court doesn't take cases to say, well done, lower court, you know, go forth. And on the flip side, they also tend to take cases where there's a lot of money involved, even if they come out the same way. So I'm not gonna read too much into the fact that there were four votes to hear the case. But it, it raises a really important question. I mean. The less important question is a matter of statutory interpretation. How do we interpret disappropriation, right? When Congress, through a substantive writer, says money cannot be used for this, how strong does that language have to be to disappropriate? The larger question, though, which I think is really important, can Congress do this? And that's in the backdrop. Uh, I think if you read the, the, the briefs, the insurance companies seem to suggest that once Congress is given that authorizing authorization, they can't undo it. And for those of us that spend a lot of time thinking about legislative process, that can't be right, right? We know that Congress has a short and a sealed. I mean, if we're going back to kind of first principles, that authorization and appropriation are both necessary, uh, and that when you enter into this, you've got to you know, really kind of realize that if you're going to rely on an authorization from Congress, you have to also know that you're going to be subject to annual appropriations. At least that's the idea. Now, there are a number of other arguments. They argue that there's an applied contract. They, they try to get around the fact that it's been disappropriated. I don't... Short of actually defunding uh, the general fund, I don't think you have you could find a clear substantive writer saying we don't want this money to be spent on that, right? Uh, but maybe the court would. I, I just don't see it happening. But maybe the court would say that you have to say more. You actually have to defund uh, the, the whole the the, the the whole appropriation. Not it's not enough to include a substantive writer. Uh, just on the the arguments being advanced by the insurance companies, is it, is it a contracts clause argument or is it something, I mean, I've, I've heard some, um, you know, advocates say that this would call into question the full faith and credit of the United States in terms of, of meeting its obligations. I mean, do you have a, I don't know if you know this case inside and out, I don't hate to put you on the spot, but what's just the general tenor of the, of the arguments on why Congress must fund this? So the, the, the principal argument is one of statutory interpretation that, that it wasn't clear enough that they were disappropriated. I think that's going to be where most of the action is. They did grant both Q questions presented. The second one is an implied contract claim. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't wrapped my head around that one as much. I'm also not sure just based on the briefing that that's really where the action is in the case. I have a, a question for the panelists. One issue that, that, that's come up a few times uh, in the lower courts and it's made its way up to the Supreme Court a little bit, and including an, a, an order that came out yesterday, it involves nationwide injunctions. Uh, there's been sort of increasing debate over the, the issuance of what's called nationwide injunctions by federal district courts. Uh, one, one federal district judge can issue a preliminary injunction that prohibits the federal government from enforcing a policy, not just in that federal district or even in the circuit, the collection of states, but nationwide. And of course, this is not a, a new innovation. There were plenty of nationwide injunctions uh, issued against the Obama administration on a variety of issues, and now we see them against the Trump administration. It's my sense, and, and please 
correct me, um, that the Supreme Court has nudged back a little bit against this practice in a few orders. Uh, yesterday, for example, in a case involving a challenge to uh, the Trump administration's new asylum petitioning policy, um, there was a, the Supreme Court issued a stay against a district judge's injunction blocking the new policy. I, th I gather it was a seven to two vote in the Supreme Court to stay the lower court's injunction because Sotomayor and, and, and Ginsburg dissented. Um, not focusing too much on that specific case, but just in general, what's your sense of this debate right now about nationwide injunctions? Um, Ellen, has that been a, a big issue in environmental law or? or uh, it's certainly an issue that comes up a lot in environmental cases. Um, specifically, what comes to mind is uh, the Clean Water Act litigation over the uh, waters of the United States rule. Um, it's come up in all of those. It's, it's kind of interesting. There's a case in Southern District of Texas where you know DOJ has made very clear that it does not support nationwide injunctions from district courts. And in that case, DOJ, they were seeking to block the Obama era WOTUS, it's called WOTUS rule. Um, They're seeking to block that rule and the uh, various uh, agriculture, um, oil, and other, other groups that were opposed to the Obama rule were pushing for a nationwide injunction. And DOJ was, was really stepping carefully and saying like, no, we want you to enjoin the rule or, and block the rule um, within your jurisdiction, um, but we're not asking for a nationwide injunction because we really don't support it. Uh, and I, I have not seen in the past two and a half years, I've never seen a DOJ official speak without mentioning their distaste for nationwide injunctions. <laughs> so uh, I don't know where it's going because I don't know how much of an appetite the Supreme Court has to, to say something really broad and final on that, but yeah. um, it continues to come up in every uh, judicial nominee hearing that I go to um, or that I watch, it, it's coming up. And, and the administration has, um, I think, taken many kind of bites at the apple to try to get the Supreme Court to, to um, clarify the issue. I think the only justice on the record who's gone on the record to criticize nationwide junctions has been Justice Thomas, right? Does any other panelists have any thoughts on the, just the general issue of nationwide injunctions? Yeah, I, mean, I think this is the, the, the big debate right now. I mean, the, interesting in the case that Adam was talking about, you know, with the problem with nationwide injunctions as a policy matter is that, like, one district judge makes the law for the entire country, right? Uh, and and that, that's problematic because in the Obama administration, folks would run to Texas and one really, really popular judge in Texas to get their nationwide injunction. And now we run to Hawaii and California to get our nationwide injunctions in the Trump administration. Uh, and there's just something about not allowing the law to develop across the nation, allow, you know, allow it to percolate, to allow different judges to kind of weigh in uh, is, is problematic. And it's also problematic because it's one judge, right? And they're entering these preliminary injunctions and it's kind of the end of the matter in a lot of these cases. The Ninth Circuit did something kind of funny, I thought at least. They narrowed the nationwide injunction and said it just applied in the Ninth Circuit which is not the point. The point, is, the, the argument against nationwide injunctions is that it should only apply uh, to the parties before the case. Now, that could, if it's a class action, that's the whole class. If it's a state suing, that's the whole state, right? If other states join. So it's not, but, but it has to be limited to the relief that the parties need. Uh, that at least is the argument. Yeah. As a matter of first principles, though, I don't know if I'm entirely on board. I'm not sure the Constitution, let's say that Congress passed, wanted to pass a law that said, you district courts can enter nationwide injunctions in these situations. Does the Congress prohibit it? I think Sam Bright in Notre Dame says no. Right. I'm, I'm just not convinced that that's outside of Congress's power and the judicial power that, you know, to do that. Now, has Congress done that? I think they have. Sam Bright say they haven't. I think the Administrative Procedure Act in Section 706, when it says set aside an agency action, means set aside a rule. The rule or the executive order. Um, now, do I think it's as good as a policy matter? No, but when you actually get into like a first principles originalist type argument, I think you have some problems uh, along those lines. I think they, yeah, it's, I think there's a whole debate that's going to get up to the Supreme Court eventually. Um, so many of these cases present it, uh, but they're going to have to kind of weigh in on this kind of thorny issue. I don't know. There are others. I don't know, do you think it's like a, a matter of like, does yeah. the Constitution prohibit Congress I, from giving? I have to admit, my own initial instincts 
uh, and I haven't given nearly as much thought as Sam or the other scholars who have written on this. My own, my own instincts are similar to yours. I think it's not clear to me this is a constitutional issue. It seems to be a practical issue. My own sort of eccentric idea for reform is anytime anybody goes to a district judge asking for a nationwide injunction, the court should run a lottery, like the multi-jurisdictional lotteries. So if you go into, if you go into a, the, the Texas judge or the judge in San Francisco, and that's the problem, right, is you can kind of, you can pick the judge, basically, who's going to give you the best odds of, of giving you this injunction. So you go to Texas and you ask for a nationwide injunction, and the next thing you know, the lottery happens, and you find yourself in a district court in Wisconsin or something, right? It takes, it leaves the nationwide injunctions in place, but it takes away the sort of strategic gamesmanship and also be kind of a fun well, reality I mean, show. To right? add to it, um, I mean, to add to it, though, the strategy is even more than that in the sense that you don't have to go to one court, right. I mean, as Sam Bray points out. Right. right now, if you look at the DACA litigation, they went to, I think, four or five different district courts. And you only need to win uh, once. And they might lose twice. Doesn't matter. It's actually not a loss. As long as you only win once, you've yeah. got your nationwide injunction. So that, that is problematic as a policy matter for sure. Yeah. I'll stick with my reality show, game show idea, um, Wheel of Injunctions. Um, okay, so we've got a, a lot of folks in the audience who've been very patient and a lot of very knowledgeable folks. We have microphones, right, for, for Q&A. So um, raise your hand, a microphone will find you, and then please identify yourself. This is all being live streamed and recorded and so on. We'll start here with, with James Ridgway. And any others? Okay, we'll see. Hi, my name is James Ridgway. Uh, and yeah, I won't give you any more background than that. Uh, Chris's comments about the risk corridor litigation triggered a memory from my own sandbox. And I was curious, because it seems to overlap on these two themes, about whether it's an idea that's in play in any other sandboxes. And so I think the themes here are about meaningful judicial review of what agencies are doing and really pushing responsibility back onto Congress to own its decisions. And so in the world of veterans law, about a decade past, there was and continues to be a former congressional staffer who's now a judge on the court. And there were a couple of opinions that basically said, this is the interpretation of the law because when you look at the congressional budget estimate and you do the math, this is the interpretation that gives you the number that, con that Congress budgeted to do this thing. And those cases went up to the federal circuit and in, they got reversed by the federal circuit who made no mention whatsoever of the budget arguments, and the court gave up trying to make these arguments. But I asked Justice Sotomayor in an open forum a few years ago about whether it would be appropriate to look at congressional budgeting as an interpretive tool, and her immediate response was, no, I would never look at that. When Congress makes a promise, it makes a promise, and if they really don't want to pay for it, well, that's not my problem. Like, I'm interpreting the promise they made. And I was just wondering if the idea of congressional budgeting as a tool for the courts to interpret the law is something that has traction anywhere else, and when the defunding thought uh, triggered it in my mind. Chris, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I think that the kind of the new front on just generally on, on legislative action is going to be appropriations, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I, th I think you're going to see scholars, I know scholars are already, administrative law scholars are already working on papers about saying that we should kind of turn to a world of appropriations to manage agencies and to, and to do statutory interpretation. Um, while I think you need the, and the sword and the shield here of both, uh, I, I don't think that's a very sound approach to interpretation or to legislation. Um, I worry a lot that we legislate through substantive writers, appropriations committees, aren't the oversight committees. Uh, it's not the same type of careful, deliberate process that you'd have uh, with an oversight committee that's actually looking at a particular agency and trying to solve a substantive problem. So I worry about that. Now, uh, your point, though, is more like, do you look at that to figure out whether, how you interpret the statute? Yeah, because these are estimates yeah. to the committee of jurisdiction. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. It is I can't interesting. Be it's interesting that administrative law, which, which you teach, um, Appropriations, power of the purse, it's just a total blind spot in administrative law doctrine, but anybody in this town knows it's in many ways the most important part of Congress overseeing the agency. Even more important, the less Congress does on the, on the substantive legislation front. Right. Yeah, those are the only bills that pass these days. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? No. Uh, yes, sir, in the middle. 
Hey, uh, I'm Matt Kent. Uh, I work for Public Citizen. Uh, the question is for uh, Mr. Wallison. Um, so, say you get, um, you know, a revival of the non-delegation doctrine. The decision comes out. You talk about forcing Congress to act. So, what practically does that look like to you? Well, when Congress is forced forced to act on any issue, they have to make the major decisions that they have been turning over to um, the administrative agencies. And that is something that, is, that Congress has many incentives to do. It's difficult to legislate. It's difficult to make these decisions. They, it makes you accountable to your constituents for the decisions that you make. So it's much easier to turn these things over to the agencies. The danger, of course, is that will eventually be governed entirely by non-elected agencies that are working, on very, working from very general laws that Congress has adopted. So uh, the, the advantage of a non-delegation decision that says you've delegated too much authority to the executive branch in this particular case will force Congress to have to make the tougher uh, decisions at, uh, when it's legislating rather than simply setting a goal for an agency and giving the agency all the power that it needs to achieve that goal. Um, so that's what this is really all about, and I think the non-delegation doctrine, if it is adopted by, by the court, and that will mean many other cases will come before the court, so we'll begin to get a, jurisdiction, a jurisprudence of non-delegation, um, will eventually force Congress to make these laws, to make these decisions before it passes things out to the agencies, and that's the way the Constitution was intended to work. Could, could sure. Please. I'm very interested, uh, Peter, in the case that you're uh, profiling. Um, uh, so if uh, many more cases were to come before the court, uh, if the court overturns the non-delegation uh, doctrine in this context, how, how many of... How, how many applies the non-delegation. Applies, sorry. Uh, applies the non-delegation, right, uh, overturns delegation. Um, how many uh, of those cases do you think would be also uh, likewise n uh, national security related uh, uh, delegations, you know, the one I think of, Ellen may be familiar with this, uh, is uh, the um, delegation to, um, particularly DHS, to dispense with environmental analysis when it comes to certain uh, national security related uh, actions, particularly building the border wall. Yeah, this was in what, the Real ID Act maybe, or? I can't, you know, I can't remember. Uh, I know that uh, environmental groups have have uh, made this uh, non-delegation um, challenge before uh, and have not been successful uh, with respect to um, the authority that con Congress uh, grants to give uh, you know, DHS um, exceptions to compliance with NEPA and uh, environmental analyses with respect to certain national security-related actions or when they're justifying it on the basis of national security. I think national security, as this case I talked about is um, a national security case, theoretically, national national security is going to get the best, uh, the most liberal interpretation by the court. But you get to a point where, as, the, as the, uh, the plaintiff in this case has said, is there anything that you, the government, can say that the president cannot do under the language that is here? And uh, if it's really difficult to imagine anything that the president is constrained about, um, then it ha the nat national security issue has to, in some respect, bow to the Constitution, which requires that the uh, Congress make the laws. And in this case, they are empowered to make the laws for uh, tariffs. The interesting thing about this case, if it ever gets to the Supreme Court, of course, is that the four liberal members of the court may well be happy to strike down the president's authority um, to impose these tariffs. Um, and, of course, then the conservatives would be very happy um, to uh, get a non-delegation -dele issue adopted by the Supreme Court. So uh, we could have a 9-0 um, decision against the president, uh, which would be very interesting. Let's, let's end with a, a, a one big picture question. Um, we have just a couple <laughs> minutes left. Um, you know, uh, obviously, Gundy, there were many who hoped or, or, or expected that the Supreme Court would resurrect the non reassert the non-delegation doctrine in Gandhi. Uh, it didn't happen, but you did have an opinion from Gorsuch, joined by Thomas, which surprised nobody, but Roberts, which I think surprised some people. 
um, saying there is something here to, to think about with the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, likewise, in the Kaiser case, people, a lot of people thought this would be the end of Seminole Rock Hour deference. Uh, it wasn't, but as Chris explained, uh, Justice Kagan and the others really did sort of put new standards into the doctrine, creating, I guess we should now call it Kaiser deference, which is also kind of a funny pun, uh, but, um, or maybe it's not a funny pun, um, dad joke. Um, but uh, there you saw incremental move, right, towards more, uh, less deferential review of agency action. And then you have the commerce case where the court really did push back um, you know, with exceptional skepticism towards the Commerce Department's view or, or justification of its policy. As Chris indicated, that approach, if, if used even somewhat more often than it's been used in the past, could be a real change in judicial review. I guess where I'm going with this is there weren't a lot of big wins for the regulatory reformers, but it seems like there might be a bit of a zeitgeist in that direction. And so the question is, how do you think about this current moment in administrative law and regulation? I mean, do you think that there is a, a change happening? Or do you think this is kind of like the federalism revolution of the 90s, where there's a couple of interesting cases and then it, it peters out? Uh, Peter? I, I think this is a, a move that will have some a strength behind it and will go on for a period of time as long as there are these five justices on the court who uh, think of themselves as constitutionalists or originalists or textualists, textualists or anything like that. Um, I, I see the Kaiser case as really eliminating um, our deference. It's, if the court goes through all the steps that Kagan mentioned in her opinion, to give deference, they're going to say, oh, the heck with it. Why bother? Um, I'm going to look at what the statute says, and if I think the statute is properly being enforced, I'm going to prove what the agency did, and if I think they've gone too far, I'm going to disapprove. I think, I think we'll find in the future that our deference is gone. Um, the same thing, I think, is going to happen to Chevron for the same reason, and that is the, the court is going to want to take back a lot of the power that has been given to administrative agencies. And they lose that power when the agency has the opportunity to defer to um, a, an administrative ruling of some kind. So, they will start pulling back on that, and then, of course, the non-delegation doctrine. Um, if a case, a good case gets to the court, when these five um, conservatives are on the court, I think we'll see a non-delegation decision. Great. Anybody else? How should we think of sort of the big picture of, of what's happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we're in ch challenging times when it comes to the administrative state and the role of Congress and the political branches, and... You look at the Supreme Court, and as an administrative law scholar, this is going to be really exciting. I mean, we, you, have, you have a lot of really thoughtful jurists on the Supreme Court when it comes to administrative law. You have presidential administrativists like Kavanaugh and Kagan, who have thought a lot about the importance of presidential power and political accountability. You have some liberty-loving uh, ju justices like Gorsuch and Thomas who have deep skepticism of unelected bureaucrats. And then you have um, justices Alito and, and Roberts that are harder to kind of pin down, but they have some administrative skepticism. And then on top of that, you have Justice Breyer who might be the administrative law professor on the court. And you have like a court that's well-equipped to work through these and try to strike balances. So I don't see a destruction of the administrative state coming at the Supreme Court any time, or a deconstruction for that matter either. Yeah. But I do think that you see, you're going to see some very thoughtful opinions like Justice Kagan's opinion on, on our deference that really tries to strike that balance between political control, agency expertise, between you know, the role of Congress. And so I actually think you will see some really in interesting reforms to how courts uh, approach reviewing agency actions. You know, the two justices that I don't think you mentioned, Ginsburg and Sotomayor, right? They're the two that dissented from that order yesterday, right? Skeptical of what the administration's doing. Um, anybody else? Yeah, I mean, this is not going to be the most provocative uh, opinion, but I, I do think uh, it all hinges on Justice Roberts, um, right? Uh, and, you know, my sense of it is just like the last term, 
we kind of see him getting you know close to the edge and then looking over the brink and then backing off, right? Uh, so I'm not sure that that's uh, going to change, but maybe if the right case presents itself. And I think Judge Kavanaugh is a little bit of a wild card for what you say uh, as well, uh, Chris, because um, he, he does have this background as kind of a unitary executive uh, supporter and, and presidential administrative. Well, let me say this about Justice Roberts. I mean, he has been very flexible in the past. Um, and uh, many people, at least among conservatives, are worried about him. But the case to look at is City of Arlington. In the City of Ar Arlington case, he did two things. First of all, he attacked Chevron in the face of Scalia's uh, opinion in favor of Chevron. Um, and Scalia got, if you, if you read the case, you'll see Scalia was quite angry about that. Um, they're after Chevron, he said. Make no mistake about it. But the second thing that, that Roberts did was he made a statement that was exactly along the lines of what um, a non-delegation, person who favored non-delegation would say, and that is the court has to stay within its, I'm not quoting exactly, court has to stay within its authority, but it also has the responsibility to make sure that the other branches of the government remain within their scope of authority. And by that he means, the I, I think it's obvious that he means, um, the legislature has to make the legislative decisions and the executive uh, has to follow those decisions and shouldn't have the power to go beyond those to actually make law. So that I think is, is something that is important because he's then reiterated in, uh, in Kaiser, the fact that he still thinks that Chevron is not good law, we're going to be dealing with Chevron at another time. This, what I'm doing here in Kaiser doesn't have anything to do with Chevron. So I think we're going to see Roberts taking a lead here because he believes that it's important for um, the, the court to step in and, and deal with what's happened years with administrative agencies getting much more power than they were probably intended to have. Alan, we have a, a minute left. Do you have a, a closing thought? Oh, I'll just say, you know, the issue of, of the evolution of administrative law and, and regulatory reform, both of those, those, you have our attention. We, journalists are paying attention to this. Um, we, you know, I certainly invite anybody to, to reach out to me to let me know about your ideas and help me grapple with it so that I can explain it clearly to, to all of our readers. Great. Well, just a couple of uh, programming announcements as we wrap up. Uh, we're just speaking of the Chief Justice. Uh, AEI will have an event on October 1st on the role of the Chief Justice in American constitutionalism, featuring a variety of scholars of uh, different Chief Justices. So we look forward to that. Uh, the Gray Center tomorrow uh, across the river in Arlington, we have a day-long conference on the White House, OIRA, and cost-benefit analysis uh, with a keynote from the acting OIRA administrator. So I look forward to that. But I want to thank everybody here today and everybody viewing online. And please join me in thanking our experts. <laughs>